بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Prayer of opening now, it should be a completely different experience than it was before you heard this class. And at the very beginning, when I was teaching from the book, when Sheikh Hamdi wasn't well enough to teach, I was teaching from the book, The Way to the Quran, and talking about how it's all about the need to actually be transformed by this message from Allah, from God, from our Creator. And if it doesn't change anything inside you, if it doesn't change your inner makeup, if you remain the same, then you're missing the most important experience that you should have with the Qur'an. It's just going to be like water off a duck's back. It's going to be like this rain landing on concrete. Rain landing on concrete is not like rain that lands on earth. Every single drop of this rain that we've had today, which lands on actual earth, makes a difference, will produce something, absolutely. None of it goes to waste. None of it is just random. It will have an effect on the flowers of May and the flowers of June and the flowers of July and the well-being of the soil come August and its resilience come September, October, November, December. All of it, this rain, every single drop is benefiting that soil and that earth. But all of this rain landing on a sidewalk, the best that it will do, or the most that it could do, which is not even the best, is maybe damage some part of it. If water puddles remain in its cracks, perhaps it will cause that sidewalk to deteriorate. So we don't want to be that concrete and that cement on which the rain of God's message is falling. It won't benefit us. The, the most that will happen in terms of effect could be that it would actually end up destroying the cement, which could be a good thing in the end. Maybe it will give way to some earth in us. But you have to come with an earth that's open and prepared. The earth, that earth is your heart. In fact, there's a relationship between the word heart and hearth and earth. These are words in the English language and they're coming from the same root, the earth and the heart. Look at, look at even the, the letters and the, the hearth, which is the home, and the earth, which is also a home, and the heart, which is also a home. The heart is the home for God's words. You have to open the doors to let them in. Don't leave them standing there outside the door, not able to arrive at the destination that they were destined for. The prayer of opening. What should come to mind and to heart when you recite the first chapter of the Qur'an? I bring myself to the door of God, in the name of God, closer to me than all my relatives, creator of relationships, and the one who nurtures them best. My devotion and my praises flow to God, the guide and nourisher of the soul and conscience of every being, the one Lord, closer to me than myself, the one to whom I belong, the ground of my being, the source of my life and the origin of my identity. I sing the name of my Lord, King of my heart, owner of my soul, judge of my intentions, the truth of my interactions and the sincerity of my engagement with him. My Lord and nourisher of my soul, here I am in your court honored by this private audience with you. I stand before your majesty. I beseech you on my behalf and on behalf of all creation, echoing the eternal voice of all conscious beings, those who came before me, those who are living with me, and those who will come after me, I say, our journeying is to you, and in you we find our strength, assistance, and support you light the way and you give the will. You are the end and you are the means. Guide us on your straight path. Lead us in your good way, the way of eternal bliss walked by your beloved ones, 
those who awaken to become witnesses to your abundant grace, who appreciate and fully experience your blessings. I seek refuge in your eternal grace and everlasting light, O my Lord and teacher of my soul, from being of those who are blind to your beauty and goodness, who stay deaf to your call of love, those who consume, dishonor, devalue, or take your gifts for granted. I seek refuge in your eternal grace and everlasting light, my Lord and teacher of my soul, from being of those whose resistance has made them experience divine gifts as deprivation, for whom blessings become barriers and opportunities for guidance and closeness to you become the very cause of their severance. I knock at your door, my Lord. I am at your threshold. Do not let me turn away. May this door never become an obstacle. Open my being to you and open the way for me. Amen. Alhamdulillah. So we said, we've been saying that this Fatiha, this starter, this opening, is the setting of the theme. It's the setting of the, the tone of the entire Qur'an, of the whole message. And for the rest of it's setting the tone inside you for the rest of your experience of reading Qur'an. And this Fatiha is to give you the right mindset and heart set. Because there is really one way to approach it. It's not simply, I said it because I said right, and many people think, oh, there are many right ways. What do you mean right? There is one right way. And, and Allah is showing it to us in the prayer of opening, come this way, come to me this way. Come to me open, don't come closed. Come to me humble. Don't come to me believing that you will master the Qur'an. Come under, come with a, as, as Shaykh Hamdi says, come with a desire for understanding. And you can only understand when you stand under. When you stand under and let the meaning fall upon you. You're not coming from above like a scientist looking at something in a microscope. No. You can't encompass the meaning of Qur'an. You can only allow it to fall like rain on your heart and nourish something, a new life in there. And so it's setting for you the mindset and the heart set, the heart setting, the setting of your heart, the landscape of your heart. The landscape must become, at this point, open and like the earth waiting for the rain to come, ready to be exposed to that blessing. And we said also that with reference to the last three lines of the Fatiha, that these are lines that refer to the universal human history, which involves people who were open to the message of God and who allowed his nourishing rain to water their souls and to give new life to their hearts day after day and who were able because of that experience to become part of a circle of consciousness and another dimension of being released from the shackles of their worldly experience and allowed to enter into a much higher realm and, a, and another dimension of experiencing this life, a dimension in which they were able to experience all of God's blessings fully. Unlike so many of us who only are able to experience 1% sometimes of a full blessing that he's given us, we can only taste it 1%. Like somebody who's stuffed up and you give them the best food, and they just can't, they just can't get the taste of it. It's not because there's something wrong with the food. Another person will be relishing that food, but something inside us is not open. As Rumi said, your olfactory nerve is not working. You can't catch the scent of this beauty, or you can't taste it properly. These people who are able to open themselves and allow God to open them up to his teaching, they were able to enter this other way of experiencing life 
in which they were able to fully feel his presence and see everything in its truth. And also asking Allah, asking God to protect us from becoming the opposite of that, which is people who take blessings for granted. People who just take their blessings for granted and devalue them in the end by doing that. They start to think of it as no big deal. A halaqa is no big deal. Learning about Qur'an, oh, we've heard about it lots of times now. It's just oh, no big deal. Oh, fasting is no big deal. Sometimes we're like that. The first day you're like, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbi, you let me fast. As we say in the dua of iftar, you assisted me so I was able to fast. You really feel it the first day. And maybe by now the 18th day is just, oh, it's no big deal. Really? But we still say the dua every night. It's a sunnah. It's the way of the Prophet. So I said, just every day you're supposed to say, Ya Allah, you help me. I was able to fast because you helped me. But look at how the human being starts to stray from that understanding. And that's called taking something for granted. That's exactly how it works. The beginning, the first experience, you're really appreciative. And then little by little, take it for granted. We have to bring our, this, this, the fact that we say this prayer of opening 17 times a day is to keep bringing ourselves back to, no, no, these things sh should not be taken for granted. In fact, I seek refuge in the face of my Lord, in his everlasting light from becoming like that. I don't want to be in that category of people who receive gifts and just thought it's no big deal. And the other category, which is those people who in fact, the opportunities for guidance and closeness to God became the very reason for their being severed from, from God. And the whole of Qur'an is about these kinds of choices. The choices that lead to you being in these different categories. The whole of Qur'an then it becomes an elaboration of what does it mean to be in any one of these three categories. And the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that is through his illustration of our own human history. What other people before us have done, how they have treated the, the opportunities that came to them, and what were the good outcomes and what were the negative outcomes of the decisions that they made. And indeed, all of our life is a series of decisions to make. Every single moment contains in it decisions. Every single moment. And that's why it's so important that we are, that we embrace being awake and we embrace awareness because if you don't, then you're, you will not experience the moments as decisions. You'll be like, oh, I just, I just was, uh, I was in that class and yes, or Quran was being recited and I just got distracted or I just zoned out. And you will, you will see it as being not a decision. You'll see it as just, oh, I was not, I didn't make a decision to zone out. I didn't make a decision to not listen to Quran nicely. It just happened. But if you're awake, if you accept to be a Khalifa, if you accept to be someone who carries responsibility on this earth, you won't be saying things like that. You understand that all of these things are choices that I make. And I need to be prepared to make the right decisions and then to be able to be accountable for them. We live in a society where everything is, oh, I didn't mean to, oh, I didn't know, oh, it just happened, oh, it's just random. And, and the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this, this Quran to empower us and to bring us back to the fullness of our humanity, which is, I have power. I have power to make decisions. And my decisions absolutely have an impact, not only on me, but on generations to come. As this beautiful translation says, I say, I echo, and I uh, echoing the eternal voice of all conscious beings, those who came before me, those who are living with me, and those who will come after me. Because this entire group, people who are here with you in the world today, people who came before you, and people who will come after you, they're affected by the decisions you make. You can be a bringer of good, or you can be Somebody who closes the doors of good. There's a dua that we make, in fact, in which we ask Allah, Oh Allah, make us keys to goodness. And people who shut the door on evil. 
And we're talking about doors, we're talking about opening. You can become, in fact, the key that allows other people to become open to Allah. Decisions that you make, all of life is a series of these decisions. Now we're going to start, inshallah, with the next surah that comes in Quran, which is Surah Al-Baqarah. It's the second chapter of Quran. And it starts with Alif Lam Mim. Would you recite the first few verses? Please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لا ألف لام م ذلك الكتاب ألف لام ذلك الكتاب لا غيب فيه هدى للمتقين ذلك الكتاب لا غيب فيه هدى للمتقين تقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من رد بهم أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون بسم الله so this surah uh, begins with the Verse Alif La Mim. These are letters in the Arabic alphabet. And one of the meanings that there is no tafsir that gives a defini definitive meaning. There is no commentary that gives a definitive meaning. But one of the meanings that I have heard Sheikh Hamdi teach is that it, these letters symbolize the journey of this message from the realm of the infinite to the realm of the finite. And they also represent a kind of address that you have at the beginning of any kind of message, which is that this is from this person to that person, or this is from this source to that recipient. And Alif Lam Mim can be understood to represent Allah to Muhammad 
Allah li Muhammad. Allah, his name starts with the alif. Li in Arabic, this lam, this letter li means two. And mim is the first letter in the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how it is understood by many teachers and scholars. But as I said, this is a, it represents this, this bringing to the finite realm of the earth this divine message, which is by, na by the nature of its source, it is infinite. And the lam, this lam in the middle is the connector. So even if you look at the letter alif, alif is a line in Arabic, and a line is infinite. We know that even mathematically speaking, uh, lines continue in both directions. So there is this idea of this infinity, and then you have the lam, which is the connector, and then you have the meme, and in the letter meme, you have a, a circle, a closed circle, which is like the human being, limited. It's not an infinite, it's, it's set in place. And you have this, this beautiful exchange or this beautiful flowing of God and God's divine light into the human world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tells us, this is the kitab. Dalik al-kitab. This is the kitab. Many people think that the word kitab means book. However, kitab actually means letter, especially at the time when the Quran was revealed. They didn't have books like we have. They didn't have book binding. They didn't have those things. They had the most that they would have was that they would write something, inscribe something on a leather, a piece of leather, or a piece of a scroll paper, some kind of paper that they might have made from leaves or something like that. They didn't have books. So the real original meaning of kitab is message or letter or mission. And we know that it can be defined as being mission because we have verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses a prophet, Prophet Yahya, Prophet John. And he says to Sayyidina Yahya, Ya Yahya, khud al-kitab bi quwa and Sayyidina Yahya, Prophet John, didn't have a, a revelation. So he's not telling him, oh Yahya, take this book with strength. It cannot mean book in that context, for sure, because there was no even book like we understand. There wasn't even a revelation that was given to John by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is this word? Ya Yahya, khud al-kitab bi quwa. Oh Yahya, oh John. Take this mission with strength. Take your mission. So kitab also means mission. So what we find in the opening of this chapter is alif lam mim, a message from Allah to Muhammad, or a message from the infinite world to the finite world. This is the mission. La roi bafi. This is a mission. This is your mission. Allah is speaking to Muhammad sallam first. And there is no doubt that this is your mission to guide people. This is your mission is to guide people. Or if you want to think of it as letter, this is a letter from God. There is no doubt that this letter is there to guide. Okay? This is the beginning. This is the opening. And this is what is, what is happening in these verses is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing Quran. And Allah introduces Qur'an in many places in Qur'an. But this is the first introduction that we come across. Because Al-Fatiha was not an introduction to Qur'an. Al-Fatiha was a setting of the scene. Al-Fatiha, as we said, was a setting of the tone. Al-Fatiha was putting you in the right mode that you need to be to even begin to hear the word of God. And now Allah is introducing, what is this message? This is, this is this message that is, there is no doubt that it will be a guide for those who are muttaqeen, those who seek. Those who are seeking, they'll find it in, in it the guidance they need. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we said, mentions what the Quran is in many places. And I want to share with you uh, Another introduction that Allah gives to Qur'an later on in the... I'm saying later on, we know that these verses were revealed at different times, but 
in terms of the Quran we have today and the order that it's in, it comes later. So I'm going to recite that to you. I'm going to start with the study Quran, which is a beautiful edition uh, by the, the editor in chief, Sayyid Hussein Nasr. It's a very beautiful book that is, provides a tafsir, provides a commentary on Quran and a very good translation as well. And I'm going to recite to you from Surah An-Nur. And these verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Quran, they are right at the same, in the same set of verses as the very famous verse about Allah nur samawati wa ard. Please recite. In Arabic first. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ آيَاتٍ مُبَيْنَاتٍ وَلَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ آيَاتٍ ومثلا من الذين خلوا من قبلكم ولقد أنزلنا إليكم آيات مبينات وَلَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ آيَاتٍ مُبَيْنَاتٍ وَمَثَلًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمَوْعِظَةً لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب ذري يوقد من شجرة مباركة يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسس نار يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم يمسسه نار يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم Bismillah. We have indeed sent down unto you clarifying signs 
and a description, a description of those who have passed before you, and an exhortation for the reverent ones. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is a niche, wherein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. The glass is as a shining star kindled from a blessed olive tree, neither of the east nor of the west. Its oil would well nigh shine forth, even if no fire had touched it. Light upon light, God guides to, to his light whomsoever he will, and God sets forth parables for mankind. So the introduction that I want to focus on, as you can see, it comes right before this famous, these famous verses, or the famous verse about light that we often read, and, and you probably recognize it even if you don't know the meaning. We've heard it many times. But the introduction is, we have indeed sent down unto you clarifying signs. So that's the first thing that this Qur'an is. Allah is introducing, what is this Qur'an? What is it that I have sent down to you? What is it that has been revealed to you? Number one, clarifying signs. Number two, and a description of those who have passed before you. That's number two, a description of those who have come before you. And number three, an exhortation for the reverent. An exhortation for the reverent. Mawaida. I'm going to read another version of a, a translation. Bismillah. And this is, this is a translation by our Sheikh Ali Unad, a very great scholar and teacher from Turkey who is sadly in prison. He's been imprisoned. And he's a, mashallah, he's a great man. Make dua for him, inshallah. We have both of these translations in the Lotus, and it's, it's important that you have good translations of Quran. That's what this whole class is about. Um, so people often ask, what is the best translation I can use of Quran? Use, obviously, what you can of our teachings, and also have these, these books with you, inshallah. Bismillah. Indeed, we have sent down to you revelations which show the truth clearly and illuminate your way, and examples from the histories of those who have passed away before you, and an instruction for the God-revering, the pious. So again, we have, obviously, the three, the three purposes of Qur'an are being explained to us in this ayah, and this translation is telling us that number one, to show the truth clearly and illuminate your way. That's the first maqsad, that's the first purpose. Number two, examples from the histories of those who have passed before you. And number three, an instruction for the God-revering, the pious. This is the introduction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving of the Qur'an. What is this Qur'an? Alhamdulillah. So as you can see, there is this mention very clearly of examples from past peoples, examples from peoples who came before you. And again, it deserves to be said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not talking about past peoples in order for us to feel arrogant towards them, to look down on them, to say, mm, I would never do that. Oh, how could they have done those stupid things? How could they have made those glaring errors? Allah is, is showing you these examples so you can understand that you are walking the same path of life and you will have choices to make and your choices will lead you to be one way or the other in the end. Right. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, recite the Qur'an with huzn, recite the Qur'an with a sense of sobriety and a tinge of sadness because it was revealed that way. And think about that. Is Allah speaking in a triumphant way about these people who went wrong? That's not the, that's not the reality, that's not what we know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants people to be guided. He wants, the Creator wants the creation to do well, to flourish, to thrive, to arrive. 
So this is one of the reasons why this Qur'an was revealed with a sense of sorrow. Look at the, look at the nature of humanity. Look at this people who take blessings for granted. What could be worse than that? It's better to not have a blessing than to have a blessing and then ruin it. It's like the, that word in French, I love it, gâché. It's so well, yani, it's a perfect sounding word for that wasting. Wasting an opportunity, wasting a gift. Just, and in English, of course, gash means to put a, to put, to stab something, to gash something is to, uh, to put a rip in it. That's what we're doing when we waste the blessings of Allah. Right? Alhamdulillah, you're, we are able to take those lessons from Quran because we've started with Al Fatiha. We've started with that sense of, I'm coming to you, you are the nourisher of my soul, you are the ground of my being, you are the creator of all the relationships that I have, and you keep your relationship with me the best. Nobody else can maintain their relationship the way you, you maintain your relationship with me. You're coming understanding that. Oh my Lord and nourisher of my soul, if you skip the Fatiha, if you skip that preparation process, you will find the huzn of the Qur'an to be too much for you. You'll find that, that sorrow and the, the power of the examples that are being given, they will, you won't be able to handle it. And I said that to you when I, in one of the earlier classes that I have, I have friends who said, I can't read Qur'an. I can't, the, 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 the descriptions of people who went wrong and what happened to them, I, it's too much for me. It's too depressing for me. It's too shocking for me. Because you're not, you didn't start with Fatiha. You don't understand who is this letter coming from? One who loves you and is empowering you with a hindsight that doesn't even belong to you personally. Is giving you a hindsight to look back at your human history in order that you might be able to apply that to your life and not be one of those who misses the, the blessings and who misses the opportunities. It's the empowerment of the human being, this letter, this Qur'an that Allah has, has revealed to us. Alhamdulillah. So while you, you, you recite it with sorrow, it doesn't mean that you feel depressed at the end of listening to it. No, you feel empowered, you feel honored to have been blessed with this knowledge that goes far beyond your limited human experience of 40 years or 60 years or 30 years or 15 years. You're being shown your entire human history that these are the people, aflaha, these are the people who found joy and, and redemption and, and the ultimate everlasting happiness. I'm showing you exactly how they got there so that when you get those opportunities, you know how to seize them. And I'm showing you those who who didn't recognize those things. So that when you come to that situation, you can avoid that and you can always be in a state of protect me from that dimension of deprivation. Protect me from ever going into that way of being. Alhamdulillah. And why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going back to Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this is a revelation for those who yu'minuna, they believe in al-ghayb, they believe in the unseen, they trust that there is an entire realm that's not visible to them, and they operate on that basis. And those who believe in what was revealed to those who came before them. This line also reminds us of this sense that when we come to Qur'an, we come as people who are part of a larger history. We don't believe we're the first to ever have received a revelation from God. We, we, we set ourselves in the, in, the, in the long arc of history that we're part of a greater story and we're one of many peoples who have received guidance from Allah. And we believe in, in, the, in the guidance that other people received before us. I mean, we're, not in a, we're not individualists, we're not mavericks, we're not coming out of nowhere. No, we're part of a longer story, the story of Allah's interaction with humanity since the very beginning. And we believe in the truth of earlier revelations. I'm going to read to you from this beautiful um, 
translation, I would say, of Quran as well. This is not all the verses. These are select verses that were translated by our teacher, Lex Hickson, Sheikh Noor al-Jarahi. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, Allah Yirhamu, has a very beautiful story of how he came to Islam, how he came to the submission to the one creator after having looked in many, many places and tried many different uh, settings and coming to Quran, mashallah, his understanding bears witness to the sincerity of his searching. Sfina. Allah's divine song inside the Quran. The Holy Quran, we must always remember, does not contain the human speech and thought of the Prophet Muhammad but is a divine song of power and love, sung directly by Allah, the ultimate source of the universe, through the personal, cultural, and spiritual being of his Prophet. The Holy Quran, we must always remember, does not contain the human speech and thought of the Prophet Muhammad but it is the divine song of power and love, sung directly by Allah, the ultimate source of the universe, through the personal, cultural, and spiritual being of his prophet. The Holy Quran, in its depth, is direct revelation, regardless of whatever historical studies are made of its sur surface. No meditation upon the Quran, no matter how strong the inspiration or how broad the scholarship could begin to equal the Arabic original, simply because the Arabic Quran remains in the realm of revelation. So I'm going to repeat those, those two sentences, inshallah. They're very, very important. The Holy Quran in its depth is direct revelation. This, not this, but the Arabic, it's direct revelation. That's its reality. It's not a record of a revelation that happened in a historical period, in a particular historical period. It is revelation happening. That's what Quran is. Quran can never be said to be a writing down of a historical event that happened to Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and has come to an end. It is revelation, even now. It's happening now. It will constantly be in the realm of revelation. The Holy Quran in its depth its direct revela is direct revelation, regardless of whatever historical studies are made of its surface. No meditation upon the Quran, no matter how strong the inspiration or how broad the scholarship could begin to equal the Arabic original, simply because the Arabic Quran remains in the realm of revelation. This is a living revelation, occurring afresh each time the Holy Quran is sung or chanted. For these Arabic words are the actual resonance of Allah Most High. And thus they transmit healing, protecting, transforming, and illuminating power directly from the source. This is a re living revelation occurring afresh each time the Holy Quran is sung or chanted. For these Arabic words are the actual resonance of Allah Most High. And thus they transmit healing, protecting, transforming, and illuminating power directly from the source. Heart of the Quran, this book, Heart of the Quran, attempts to suggest the spiritual richness of the original text in a dignified contemporary English. The title, Inspirations from the Holy Quran, was suggested by Sheikh Muzaffar, who reviewed and approved the manuscript in order to make clear to the reader that this is a book of personal inspiration that lays no claim to scholarly or religious authoritativeness. So he's talking about his book and he's being humble and saying that I'm not claiming to be a scholar, but this is a very beautiful and important book that I believe should be in every single home.
It has to be in every single home because this author, as I said, he, and as you can see, his very description of what Quran is, is evidence of his depth. How many of us even have begun to contemplate that every time that Quran is being recited, this is a resonance of Allah coming to you, right? So, alhamdulillah. And I really want to say about this book and about the author that it's a shame that this book has existed for a long time. I think it was, it was, it was, it was published in the 80s. How many people here know of this book? If you didn't hear it from us, how many of you knew that it existed? This beautiful, this beautiful translation of, of verses of Quran. The problem is that we have people for so long who have tried to be gatekeepers and keep, keep other people and keep sometimes keep us away from experiencing the fullness of our faith, right? Gatekeepers who, who want to say things like, oh, Lex Hickson, he was new age. He wasn't really a scholar. But it, you would be deprived if you hadn't read that, that, that paragraph that I just read to you. That's knowledge. That's scholarship. That is the essence of what it means to be, to be trying to approach Allah is when you can understand what has been understood here. So we have to, we have to be very careful as people who are seekers. We have to be very careful of criticizing other people on the path, especially those who have something to give us. We have an, an unfortunate culture, a very unfortunate culture that is developed that was never there at the beginning of putting people in boxes and trying to keep them away from other people or putting people in boxes to criticize them. We have a very strong culture of criticism and critique that ends up depriving us of sources of learning and sources of reconnecting to our own Lord. And subhanAllah, you know, I'm saying this because some people even would look at our translation or our interpretation or our meditation on Surah Al-Fatiha and say, what is all of this? Why is it as if we're adding words to the Qur'an? And that is not the case. First of all, we're calling it a meditation. And secondly, subhanAllah, how much longer are we going to stay with our, with our dry and limiting and limited response to Qur'an that makes you want to go and read poetry instead? How much longer that you, you feel happier to read affirmations on Facebook than to read the affirmation of God? Fatiha has just become just meaningless for us. It's just something you'll have to do. Like all those, like that silly idea that whenever we have a banquet or whenever we have a wedding or whenever we have a public event, find some random qari, put him up there and make him recite some verses. Nobody knows what he's saying. Nobody understands. Nobody's listening to what he's saying. Just, that's just part of the whole way we do things. As if Islam is just a cultural identity. As if Quran is just something to get, get it over with at the beginning of any dinner. I'm talking about the community dinners that we hold here in North America or the weddings that we hold. Make that Qadi stand up there before we go into all our speeches praising the couple and saying how great they are. So the Quran isn't about, the, this Quranic recitation doesn't make us when we hear it, when that poor Qadi, usually a teenage kid, is reciting, it doesn't make us feel how great Allah is because we don't even know what's being said. And then next we have speeches about, oh, the groom is such a great guy. Here's a whole slideshow about everything great that he did since the day he's born. And the, and the, the, the bride, such a wonderful girl, look at her. And then this is the moment when they met and we get to see all the photos of them when they first met each other. And the whole thing is just praise of, of, a, of two human beings. And God is just a formality. Get it out of the way. Fatiha cannot become like that. Al-Fatiha cannot become like that. The verses of Qur'an, we cannot do that to them. So these translations and this work is vital. And for 
some people to just dismiss it as, oh, that's new age or that's whatever, or this very book has been dismissed in that way. This very book by people who, as far as I'm concerned, they don't even deserve to be called anything more than sour grapes because their critique is at that level. Their critique is just sour grapes because it's a very beautiful, very beautiful work and very helpful. And to criticize it and to say and to accuse the authors as people have, when it first came out, there was a storm of anger and critique and, and, and accusations online about this book. These people are perennialists. That's what was said about them. Perennialism refers to the idea that someone believes that all paths to God and all religions are correct. Just choose whichever one you want and there's no problem. There isn't one that's better than the other. They were accused of being, of being that. If they really were that way, why would you spend the whole time <laughs> writing about Qur'an and, and, and speaking about how Qur'an is a message for all of humanity if you believe that all things were, were the same, first of all? And secondly, how despicable to accuse each other of things like that. Once you start to enter that realm of throwing insults against people who are trying to serve and who have no hidden agenda to misguide, then you yourself have lost your position of being able to speak, as far as I'm concerned. Because you yourself have gone against the first principle of decency, let alone the first principle of dignity and proper scholarship and what it means to be calling to Allah that is beneath you to talk like that. If you talk like that, well, what do you think the masses will do? <laughs> If you're proud to publish insults against fellow callers to God, then what do you think regular people will end up doing? It's a green light to them. So we lose the whole culture of, of, of holding people as sacred and re respecting people at the very least. Respecting your colleagues in the field at the very least. If you don't, if you don't agree with something, publish your own paper about it. That's what scientists do. That's what even atheist scientists do. They don't get, out, get online and start insulting somebody because they, they don't agree with their study. It's a study, Quran, it's a study. You publish your own paper if you, if you have different findings. No problem. So we've come to a place where now people of religion have poor akhlaq, have poor decency or less decency than atheist scientists in the way that they deal with this desire to serve people and hand people uh, understanding of Qur'an. Scientists, they, they, they work to, to hand people an understanding of science. And yes, they have disagreements, but they handle those disagreements in the most professional manner. And we, we fail to do that. So we have people, as I said, these, both of these books have come, their authors have, have been accused of being not legitimate. Okay? One is accused of being new age. The other one, as I said, the whole team is accused of being perennialist. There's a whole team behind this book. And these are, both of these things have been actually thrown at Sheikh Hamdi, by the way. And I'm talking about Sheikh Hamdi because you know Sheikh Hamdi, you know him well. And yes, people have said he's new age and people have said that he's perennialist as well. Just because he showed some respect for other ways of being, for other religions. That alone was enough for people to say, oh, perennialist. SubhanAllah. Put him in a box and dismiss him. Instead of working together, instead of trying to reach people, we're in a time of istibikul khairat. Bring what you can to help people. We're in a time of people walking away from God entirely. You should be trying to bring what you can to help. Not not undermining the efforts of someone else who's trying. That's why we always talk about those things. Please share the good teachings. Just have your part in it. Because on the day when you stand before God and He reveals to you the reality of what was happening in this world on this day, May 23rd, 2019, that you could have helped save somebody from walking away from, from eternal bliss, just by sharing this Fatiha with them, just by saying, you know what? I walked into my mosque today 
through the very same door that my brothers walk through. There are people leaving Islam because of the, the way the women's door is in the masjid. All across North America. There are people posting about that all over the place. Have you not been online? About their having to go down a dark alleyway to get to the women's door of the masjid. While men are able to walk through the mashallah, the beautiful main doors. And for some people that is too much. That is the last straw. That is the last straw. That's the straw that breaks the camel's back because it's not in isolation. They maybe come from a home as well where, where, where girls are treated differently than boys or maybe they had a husband who used Islam and, and <clears throat> you know, misused quotations from the Prophet to, to, to justify his ill treatment of her. You don't know the whole story. Give people a glimmer of hope, support what's good. This is, these are the things that we have to understand so that we shouldn't, we have to be so careful about criticizing other people once you understand the context especially, the value of the work that's being done. That you have to value every single person's work. When you're in a, look, when we're, if we're being flooded here in Ottawa, okay, we all, we all need to participate in putting the sandbags. It's not the time to say, I don't like the way you hold the bag. If the bag is coming in its place, that's all that matters. We don't have time. We don't have time. The water is coming. The flood is coming. We don't have time to say, I don't like how you pick it up. I don't like how you didn't smile at me when you... Allah? Are we on the same team or are we not on the same team? Are we working for the same cause or not? Will the destruction that's coming come to all of us or will it not? If we don't act in time and support each other, absolutely, it will come to all of us. It will come to your own children. If people are not saved from their feeling of estrangement, from the word of God, good luck to the next generation. With every passing generation, it becomes harder to tell people, just be patient. We know you don't understand a single thing about what God reveals to you, but hang on, it's okay. With every generation, it becomes harder to say that. When I was young, people could say that to me, and I was like, okay, no worries. I can't say that anymore to people in their teens. Just, okay, don't worry, just come and listen to it. It sounds beautiful, that's good enough for you. No. And it will be even harder later on for the people who are children today. We need this work to be done, and we need to celebrate it when it's done. And especially, as I said, especially for you who are women, find me another masjid where you can sit like this. Find me another masjid in the whole world where there's a woman sitting in the position I'm sitting in here where there are men and women of all ages respectfully listening. It's not about me. This is something that's, subhanAllah, you have an, you, it's really, it comes from Shaykh Hamdi. Because had he not opened that door, I wouldn't have even asked for it. I told you I'm from a different generation where I wasn't really so concerned about those things. But there are people here for whom it's made all the difference to see a woman sitting here. And there are more people still who don't even know about it. So especially you as women, where are you to share and to celebrate and to find joy in that? To say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. You, don't, you never know who's going to read what you share. Just put your intention there that you're doing it for all of humanity. Just like when, you, when you're putting sandbags, you don't don't know whose house is going to be saved by that particular bag that you put there, but it doesn't matter. We're all in it together. Just put it there. Put it there and, and do it firmly and understand this is a necessary action to take. I'm saving my whole neighborhood. I'm saving maybe three neighborhoods. You don't need to know the details of who's in the houses. It doesn't matter. You don't need to know the details of, oh, who would really read this? Who? You, just trust. Trust. Trust that there are people who are suffering because they feel that there's no place for women or women, women leadership. And that even in 2019, women find it hard to, to be in a mosque. Or that there are still mosques where you're told off because you're wearing jeans. Any random lady can come and just tell you off when you're coming to pray. And I know these things, and I know they still happen, and they happen when I was young too. 
They happened to me. I was uh, 13. I didn't grow up going to the mosque. And I started to want to go. And I remember going and being looked at funny because I didn't know how to put the hijab on properly. And it was falling off half the time. And, and just who are you? And why are you here? And who are your parents? And uh, instead of, ahna wa sahlan, we're so happy to see you. Welcome, what can we do for you? A 13-year-old girl who wants to go to the masjid, you should, my teacher said, one time she said, if a girl comes into the masjid and she's wearing skinny jeans or she's wearing a belly shirt or whatever she's wearing, you should bend down and kiss her feet. She could be anywhere else. But she came to the house of God. And she's a guest of God. And alhamdulillah, you have a mosque where that is, that is being upheld. That appreciation and respect for the guests of God is the very defining character of the Rauda Masjid and the teachings that we have. That, subhanAllah, that deserves every kind of celebration and every kind of shukr and every kind of support. And yet, there are people who come from the same traditional background as us that is, they've studied abroad in Syria or in Tarim or wherever, and they are, they are criticizing this project. They're finding fault with it. Can you imagine? To not grasp the value and to choose to criticize someone who's working on the same team as you when the flood is about to come and the dams are about to break and you have time to criticize even online and share with other people we don't agree with that project? Forget about people elsewhere who are saying that. What about even Ottawa itself? People who live in Ottawa, who are, can't be bothered to come and attend a class. And when they go to Toronto, they go to all the similar sister organizations of ours we have. We have Sister organizations in Toronto, like Seekers Hub, like Risala Foundation, Vaughan Masjid, these are our sisters and brothers. And when people from Ottawa, they go there, they go and they attend everything. But they can't be bothered to show up here. Why am I saying all of this? Because indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about people in the past, but he's telling us about also our own inner landscape and our own potential to be, as we said in that group, and not only potential, but even our own history. There are times when you have taken things for granted, there are times when I have taken things for granted, 100%. I would never be so foolish as to pretend that I didn't do that. Every day I take things for granted. Every day there, is, there, there are multiple opportunities to, to, to beg Allah to not let me go down that path. And we have to have that humility. Look at what, what, look at what Allah is telling us, that He's asking us to seek refuge in Him. From being of those to our, who are blind to His beauty and goodness, who are deaf to His call of love, and who consume, dishonor, devalue, or take His gifts for granted, especially that last line, who of us has not done that before? Consume gifts and just throw away the bones without even so much as saying alhamdulillah, or dishonor, gifts. Which of, which of, who of us can claim we haven't done that with the blessings of Allah? Or devalue them, or take them for granted? We need to learn. We need to learn, and these are places to, to, to beg Allah and also to, to gain the practice of being different than what was mentioned here. Because it's not only a prayer that you have to make, but it's a way of life that you have to take. And when you come to a place like the Rodo, that's what we're trying to teach, is how to not be of these other groups, and how to be of the group of consciousness, people who are aware of God's beauty, people who value every expression of God's light, whether it be in a teacher, whether it be in a teaching, whether it be in the dhikr, in the chance to sing the name of God. Go to another masjid where even during the adhan people are talking. That's a devaluing of God's gift. 
How did the adhan even come? It came through a dream that Sayyidina Bilal was inspired with and Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu was so happy. And he welcomed that. And now it means nothing to most of us. Oh, it's just adhan, so what? Do we ever stop to say, how beautiful this, this call is. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, listen to what is being said. Allah, you could have chosen any other words, but you chose these words. What's the story behind that? What are you telling me, Ya Allah? How lucky I am to be able to hear it instead of it being a bell or something else, even though bells are also sacred. The bell that calls people to church is also a sacred call of God. But when I say bell, I mean like our alarms. What if it had just been a, an alarm, the way that we have our alarms on the phones? Completely different. Look at the look at the the whole thing when the Imam gets up and then he 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 doesn't even face us. He turns his face, orients it towards the symbolic direction of God, the qibla. Have you stopped to taste the sweetness of that gift from Allah and so many others and so many others? So, alhamdulillah. And I want to say as well that. Not only is it injustice to insult people and, and try to use names like New Age as an insult, but it's also completely unacceptable. Even people who are New Age, you should not look down on them. We don't have a right to look down on anybody as Muslims. Many, many, many people and the majority of people in the New Age movement are looking and they're seeking and they're searching and they're trying and they're, they want to be different. They want to be are more aware, they want to awaken, they want to awaken others. They deserve all our respect. So, and they have brought many, many good things. The New Age movement has brought a lot of goodness to people and they, we can even learn from them. And we have, what is it to have a spiritual retreat? Yes, we have in our tradition, the idea of khalwa, the idea of seclusion, but the way that we're doing it now and the way that we call the name, when I write about the Lotus Blossom Retreat, I'm not somebody who just has direct inspiration from Allah. Where do you think I go to look at examples of how to write about a spiritual retreat? The New Age people who are organizing these retreats, I go and read their sites and say, how, yes, how do you communicate these things to interest a person? Well, they've brought a language that wasn't there. They brought a language that is actually the, the most appropriate language for talking about Allah and Quran in English. The language that has been used for so long is, is, is it's ossified, it's rigid. So I'm going to read to you actually, just to demonstrate to you what I mean, I'm gonna to read to you from somebody who's, and it's a new age person, and she's written a prayer that I would like to read to you, and I want you to listen in. So she says, here is a prayer I wrote in 2015 when the U.S. and Iran were negotiating the nuclear agreement. I offer it now on my knees. Peace prayer. Beloved one, living light, spirit of all that is, thank you for welcoming us to this sacred circle comprised of every hue on the spectrum of the human community. Be with us now as we lean in to hear your call. Stay close as we stand up to speak your message of unconditional love. Divine Mother, embodiment of mercy and compassion, enfold us in your protective cloak as we dare to take in the pain of the world. Give us the courage and the strength to drop our preconceptions and step onto the field of global strife, armed with the flaming arrow of unconditional love. Sacred friend, hidden behind the eyes of the broken, reveal yourself. Let us behold the beauty of your face in all beings, everywhere and always. Where once we perceived only the impossible, blinded by our desire for circumstances, people, and our own sweet selves to be different, let us rest now in what is. Let us rest now in what is. Alert to your power to astonish us with the global awakening of unconditional love. Holy One, we carry legacy of our ancestors in the marrow of our own souls. We are all reluctant prophets. We must be called again and again. 
And yet again, we turn and turn away, we yield and bow and rise, until at last, clasped by the ferocious wings of your angels, we declare, here I am. Make me a vessel of your divine will, the will of unconditional love. Great spirit, true self and no self, fill the hearts of our leaders with humility and holy awe. Embolden them not to turn away from the other, but to lay down their weapons and take the adversary in their arms. Infuse them with the fire that melts the swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Show them the secret passageway from hopeless conflict home to unconditional love. Father, Mother, God, may the children of Abraham and Sarah at last fall silent in the face of your radiance. May our hearts soar in remembrance. May our knees bend and our bodies bow down and our spirits rejoice, overflowing with unceasing prayer, resounding and cleansing and blessing all the land. There is nothing but you, nothing but God, nothing. Amen. Is this anything but the prayer of the Prophet? So I said, no. And I can see, I've been a witness to how this language comes about. It's the language of a seeker. It's a language of somebody who is being awake and aware and, and just observing the reality of things. And it comes out of a concern to share with others. In fact, I've seen that Sheikh Hamdi does not read things like this and he does not even read anything in English to begin with. So he doesn't read anything by the New Age movement. He reads sometimes in Arabic, and that's, that's when he even has time. You, you know his schedule. And yet, when we've translated together, from the beginning, the first project that we did together was Bidayat al-Hidayah, a book by Imam al-Ghazali, on the beginning of guidance. It's the first thing we ever worked on together. We had been married for one year, so that was, that was the first year of our, our, our marriage, so it was 2006-2007. And from that time, he would help me, and he would, we would, he had the Arabic understanding far more than, than me. And subhanAllah, it's the same language that you find in the New Age books. And he hadn't had any exposure to it. It's just this kind of language is born of a desire to, to let people taste and feel the original meaning. The meaning that Imam al-Ghazali was trying to communicate, the depth of it, you have to, you end up ha using that same language. And subhanAllah, in this book, which we hadn't opened until a few days ago, even though we have it, just time and all of that, we didn't refer to any book of these, either any of these three, when we, when we, when, when Shaykh Hamdi translated the Fatiha to, to be in this form that you have here, this meditational, experience of Surah Al-Fatiha. And subhanAllah, at the very beginning when it's written here, the one to whom I belong, the Lord who is closer to me than myself, the source of my life and the origin of my identity, then Shaykh Hamdi wanted to say the ground of my being. And he shied away from that word because of the word ground, so to some people it could sound wrong. Even though it's not that, it's not that it means ground, it's saying it's the very basis of my being. And subhanAllah, when Shaykh Hamdi opened this book recently, just yesterday, he found the exact same wording where this author is saying that Allah is the ground of our being. SubhanAllah. So this is it. It's not some kind of trying to be new age or trying to be, it's trying to help people understand and reconnect. And if that's not worthy of celebration and appreciation, then I don't know what is. Hmm. That's the very essence of, of, of the very beginning of things to the Prophet so said, what, what was he doing in his interactions with people? It was all that. It was this whole thing of bringing the infinite into the finite. How do you do that? How do you bring something that's infinite into the finite understanding and heart? of a small human being like you and me. It is with these same words like unconditional love, and I've talked about that many times, rahma, the way that the Prophet ﷺ defined rahma to people, that it's this mother who's lost her child and then finds her child again, that's rahma. 
that embrace is rahmah, that love, that unconditional love. Mother's love is unconditional by nature. That's the very definition of it. There is nothing else on earth that is like that. That's why the Prophet ﷺ used mother so many times when he wanted to show us that's how Allah feels about you. That's how Allah looks at you. Even more than a mother who lost her child and then found her. Find the child again. This, this is the translation of the infinite into the finite. And thus translation is a holy and sacred process. And you who are experiencing translation like this, you have to be receptive and ready and wanting to share. Just like the Sahaba wanted to share, they used to write down even just one verse of Quran and put it in the water, hoping that, hope putting it in the, the river or the lake or wherever they would travel, because they were also travelers. They didn't only stay in, in Mecca and Medina. They would travel to other parts. And there, there are, there is a narration that they would even put just verses into the, into the sea, hoping that somewhere someone would find this verse and click the way that they clicked because they believed also, they knew that Quran is revelation. Even when it's read by a random person on the shore of that beach when that, when that verse arrives, they had, they had trust in that. And this too, you have to have trust in it, you have to believe this is not coming out of nowhere. This, this, this can reach, help it to reach. Do you think those Sahabas did that because they felt they were so needed? They just wanted to have a part. And they just wanted to do something with the great concern that they felt for people. So these, these translations, and subhanAllah, I have been in situations, and I actually, for a long time, Shaykh Hamdi has been saying, we have to sit down and translate Qur'an. We have to sit down and translate Qur'an, and there's always something else that is going on, and we never, I never get focused enough to do it. And subhanAllah, this year when I was in France, they wanted me to give a talk and I said, okay, I need, a, I need to know who's translating for me because I've had experiences where people didn't translate correctly and it was so uncomfortable for me and it was so awful because you're trying to, get, you're trying to reach hearts and the person is not letting your words reach. They're changing the meaning. They're using something that has a different nuance than the word that you chose. It's, it's a delicate. This interaction between you and me is very delicate. If I choose one wrong word, it could switch everything for you. And it's not just that it's not about me, it's that we're talking about Allah here. To be so careful, to be so awake and aware. So I had that, those other experiences behind me where I didn't like how the people, even though they were professional translators, they couldn't translate. You know why they couldn't translate for me? Because they didn't know me. They hadn't heard my teachings before, not that they're my teachings, but they had never heard a class that I had given. So they couldn't pick the right word because they didn't know well enough what's her style. Or just, you know, so a word like love, there's so many options. Or a word like whatever. They're just going to pick from their dictionary of possibilities and, and, and choose a word that they think is accurate, but it doesn't match the spirit of what's being said. Okay, so I was in France now, and I said, okay, so who's going to translate for me? And they, they gave me some options. In the end, somebody translated who was, it was a disaster. Three people were translating. None of them could get it right. And I was just like, you know what? SubhanAllah, who am I to make such a big fuss about not being translated correctly when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody's translated. Very few people have been able to translate his words properly. And I had the opportunity, and I have the opportunity, and I haven't taken it seriously. And I'm insisting that I get the perfect translator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his words are being twisted and changed. And the, 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 the depth of the meaning is being stripped from them. And they're coming as dried up English words to us. Allahu Akbar. And that was what that whole experience in France was like. I was just like, okay, you know what? Shahnaz, just shut up. Because you didn't do, you have, your sin is much bigger than <laughs> than, than anything else. I taste what it feels like to not be translated properly. Not, not that Allah has feelings like we have feelings, but there is a crisis when meaning is not transmitted properly. That's a very, very tragic thing. It's a very unjust thing. So translation is essential, and translation is a holy thing. And you have to know that we're looking for the meaning. You cannot be stuck on the literal 
if there even is such a thing, because Quran is a revelation. Quran is, as, as you've heard, it's a living entity, right? So, alhamdulillah, ethically speaking, it's wrong to put people in boxes. It's wrong to, to slap a label on somebody and decide who they are. That's, that's very wrong and you'll be held accountable. And really it's, it's time to, to stop this ridiculous behavior of coming into masjids and coming into a class and just sitting there like a big judge. Do I like it or not? Oh, that person said that. Oh, it's not scholarly enough for me. Oh, it's not traditional enough for me. No. People are, are, are leaving Islam. Wake up and support. The, the, the placing of sandbags. Wake up and support it before you will be asked and the flood will come and take your friends and your children and then you'll wonder why, well, how did this happen? Because you didn't, you didn't stand side by side with those putting the, the sandbags and help them. Or at least bring them something to eat as mashallah many masajid here in Ottawa did. They went and they, they, they sent food to the sandbaggers here in Ottawa. Support somehow and get off Get off the, 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 the high horse. Really, get off the high horse. We don't have time for that. And get out of the judge's seat. There's only one judge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't put yourself in that position, ever. As I said, there are people who, who would like to call themselves students of knowledge, and unfortunately they've fallen into this, this trap of making it their business to put down other people's projects and to criticize other people, come bring what you have. That's how we should understand. Bring what you have, alhamdulillah. Bring what you have and let it be so wonderful that I don't need to do this work anymore. How about that? Instead of cutting down the work that people are doing, make your work so great that khalas, my work will be irrelevant. Alhamdulillah, that'll be a good thing. I'm not here to, to just create work. But there is work to be done. If you're such a great sandbagger, come so that I can rest. Come and put your bags because you're so wonderful at it. I won't tell you, oh, I want, I want to do it. Bismillah, you're better than me, bismillah. But don't stand there on the sidelines and just tell me everything that you don't like about my way of putting sandbags. We have to wake up. We have to wake up as Muslims. Tayyib, alhamdulillah. And we ask that you would, as I said, understand and celebrate and appreciate, you know, this translation that was all Shaykh Hamdi's wording, I just wrote it down. He's not an Anglophone, huh? His first language is Arabic. His second language is French. English is his third language. Why would somebody make that effort for you? if they didn't love you and care about you and want to serve you with every last drop of their sweat and blood. Come and witness that. And for those who think that this work is uh, not traditional enough or it's new agey, come and read what people say. Come and read what people have said, even online, the comments, so that you have some sense of hayat, you have some sense of shame before you stand up and, and criticize a project like the New Roda Institute. How? How can you be so petty and so blind? SubhanAllah. We're all in this together and we all have to, we're working for the same cause. And only a fool would start to criticize the soldier next to him when the enemy is coming. And the enemy is not other human beings. And the enemy is not anything other than, than these two states. These two states that are mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha, this state of taking Allah's gifts for granted and this state of taking opportunities for guidance as the very cause of your being cut off from Allah. Those are the two enemies that are coming towards us. Every single day, they come at us. So we have to stand by each other and help each other against those enemies. How do we do that? We can even just say things to each other like, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, isn't it great to be here? Alhamdulillah, isn't it good to have each other? Alhamdulillah. And when you open your fast, spread that sweetness. As Shaykh Hamdi said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would have, in, they would have in front of them a whole pile of dates, kilos of dates. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would open his date and 
take half of it and give it to the person on his right and the other half to the person on his left. That is community and that is sharing in the blessing. The blessing is not in that big pile in front of you. The true blessing is when you can appreciate that blessing. And how do you appreciate it? It's with these gestures, it's with this sharing, it's with this alhamdulillah. That's how you take the, the, the gift that you've been given and you make sure you're not taking it for granted. You actually seize it in your own two hands and you split it open and you share. That is the, the perfect definition of what it means to fully experience God's blessings. The Prophet ﷺ demonstrated it to us. Take it and distribute it. Take it and distribute it. He was Al-Qasim. That was his name. The one who received Allah's blessings and guidance. And now Qasim means to distribute. That was, that's, a, that's what he did. Here you are. Here you are. Here you are. Here you are. Here's this dua. Here's how you do this. Here's how we pray. Here's how we fast. Here's how we make sujood. Here's how we say subhanallah. Here's alhamdulillah. Here's Allahu Akbar. Here's the adhan. Here's how we respond to the adhan. Here's how we open our fast. Sharing, sharing, sharing with all of us until now. His hand is extended to us with that date in it. And we are receiving that date from him. That barakah, that ni'mah, that fruit. That fruit of his heart's interaction with the divine. That coming of the infinite into his being and then reaching us. We are in that. We could be in that all the time if we wanted to. We could see our whole lives as that. And everywhere I go and everything I do, this is the Prophet Wasallam handing me the infinite into my finite being and letting me experience it just like he did. That's life. That's what life is. If you want to be there, if you want to be awake, you can be awake to that. If you want to be on the level of just, I'm hungry and tired, and when is Maghrib going to be called? You can. And this is why we said, all of life is a choice. You have to make choices even about your inner state. You have to make choices about whether you choose to hear good people being criticized or not. You have to make choices about limiting your own thoughts and saying, no, we're not going there. No, that thought, I'm not entertaining it. Those are the choices that we have to make so that we can, inshallah, be of those who are guided on the straight path, who are led in Allah's good way, the way of eternal bliss, walked by the beloved ones, those who awaken to become witnesses to Allah's abundant grace, who appreciate and fully experience all of his blessings. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I bring myself to the door of God in the name of God, closer to me than all my relatives, creator of relationships and the one who nurtures them best. My devotion and my praises flow to God, the guide and nourisher of the soul and conscience of every being. The one Lord, closer to me than myself, the one to whom I belong, the ground of my being, the source of my life and the origin of my identity, I sing the name of my Lord, King of my heart, owner of my soul, judge of my intentions, the truth of my interactions, and the sincerity of my engagement with him. My Lord and nourisher of my soul, here I am in your court, honored by this private audience with you. I stand before your majesty. I beseech you on behalf of myself and on behalf of all creation, echoing the eternal voice of all conscious beings, those who came before me, those who are living with me, and those who will come after me, I say, our journeying is to you, and in you we find our strength, assistance, and support. You light the way and you give the will. You are the end and you are the means. Guide us on your straight path. Lead us in your good way, the way of eternal bliss, walked by your beloved ones, those who awaken to become witnesses to your abundant grace who appreciate and fully experience your blessings. I seek refuge in your eternal grace and everlasting light, my Lord and teacher of my soul, from being of those who are blind to your beauty and goodness, who stay deaf to your call of love, those who consume, dishonor, devalue, or take your gifts for granted. 
I seek refuge in your eternal grace and everlasting light, my Lord and teacher of my soul, from being of those whose resistance has made them experience divine gifts as deprivation, for whom blessings become barriers and opportunities for guidance and closeness to you become the very cause of their severance. I knock at your door, my Lord. I am at your threshold. Do not let me turn away. May this door never become an obstacle. Open my being to you and open the way for me. Ameen. 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 Ya Rabbal Alameen. Allah Ya Allah. Diseases.